proclaim great things. A new horseless carriage runs Springfield streets. A trip without horses. Duryea automatic carriage travels about the streets of the city. Dick for a lot of years, uh, and I guess it involves through automobiles and things that we've done in the past. And a couple of years ago, almost a couple of years ago, he uh, had mentioned that he would get interested in this Durier, which I really didn't know much about. You probably had heard it in passing. And he uh, came to my shop and he brought a wooden mock-up of a motor, single-cylinder, hit-or-miss motor. I'm familiar with them. I'm into the as a hobby thing that I do now. And I thought this was pretty interesting. He said he wants to build one. I went, Phew. Castings, trying to figure it out. Spark, gasoline, carburetor. And we made it happen. We were sitting there, and Jimmy and Dick was carrying on the conversation about building this particular unit and he was looking for a machinist and jimmy looked at me smiled at me i knew it was coming he says i want you to introduce you to the machinist that you're looking for and dick goes who might that be he says he's sitting on the left hand side of you i looked over at jimmy dick looked at me and i think at that moment the mutual bond between us became right then. Hello, I'm Richard Stevens. You're going to see one person's dream to live a piece of American history from idea to plan to reality. I hope you enjoy it. It started out in 1985 as a research paper for a course at Springfield Technical Community College on the history of the Pioneer Valley. As an automotive person, I had no idea what I was going to write about. However, when I began doing research, I made this wonderful discovery that the first American automobile, as we know it, originated in Springfield. After three years, I finally was able to actually see the car, and I thought that's a little too much, that it should take so much effort to find this part of a national treasure, so I decided to make it. I might add, however, that the original car still exists, and it is in the Smithsonian. I was allowed access to that car to simply take a piece of paper, pencil, and a ruler, and dimension every part on it, and this is what you see. This is a one-to-one -one scale of that car. My first um, component was to make the engine, because I knew that the carriage was a fairly common design, but the engine was very unique. So this is a basically a wooden prototype, and it allowed me, in, in making it as Frank had to do al also, it allowed me to determine the relationship of all the parts as they interrelate as a single component. On the four-stroke engine, one of the strokes necessary is called the exhaust stroke. And right here, this plunger opens the exhaust valve and allows the exhaust gases to leave and go into the exhaust system. It's operated by a set of gears that have one gear twice the diameter of the driving gear so that for every rotation of the crankshaft, this one operates only one half a turn. So in two complete crankshaft revolutions, we get one complete exhaust stroke because this is only rotating half as much. In 
In 1892, one of the first purchases made by Charles Duryea was the carriage that ultimately this new concept of an engine was to be installed. The carriage is known as a ladies phaeton. It's basically a very lightweight carriage and it was purchased from the Smith Carriage Works right here in Springfield. And the price that was paid in 1892 was $70 for a used carriage. I really had very little knowledge of how the carriage was constructed. I was fortunate enough to locate a book entitled Practical Carriage Building, which, interestingly enough, was published in 1892. And that provided me with uh, all the nomenclature, the terms and part identification, as well as a product that went into the manufacture of a carriage body itself. Two years ago, I was able to purchase a ladies' phaeton, a used ladies' phaeton, and of course the first thing I did was to take it apart to see how it was put together. One of the interesting pieces of information that I discovered in the course of my research on carriage building was that carriage makers, at least um, into the last part of the last century, as well as the early part of this century, turned out to be basically, in some aspects, assemblers, just like uh, current automotive manufacturing. There were companies that made axles. There were companies that made springs. There were companies that made roof bows. There were companies that made um, the very, all the various parts, the, the uh, steps that got people into the carriages. So that there are a lot of parts that were purchased by the manufacturers, but the actual carriage, this part of carriage assembly was done on site. In 1988, I built my first prototype of the Derrier carriage. And having no knowledge of what kind of material was used, I thought to myself, well, if this carriage is to support two people, then obviously it has to be made from, from strong, heavy wood. So I purchased ash. Now, ash, by all accounts, is an extremely strong, workable, but heavy wood. So when I had completed the first carriage, the first prototype of the carriage, with all the iron attached to it, the, the carriage body itself weighed over 100 pounds. Now, when you compare that 100 pounds to the carriage body that I finally produced, which is made primarily from poplar, it goes from 100 pounds in ash to approximately 30 pounds in poplar. So you can see the, the difference between the two woods. And the idea is to make it light. But also, the poplar is a very strong wood. So I had both a light and a strong carriage body to use on the, on the uh, durye. I might add that every location where there is a screw in the construction of the carriage is exactly where the, the carriage makers of the last century would have placed them. Most of the carriage body itself was pieced together, for, apparently for reasons of repair, if there was a need to replace a certain part and if they could do that. So very few pieces were actually hard glued, never to come apart again. After the carriage body gets assembled and it's time for the upholstery, the, um, the side panels and the rear seat, the rear seat panel will be part of the carriage itself. The seat portion itself of the carriage will be like a pad because there's a, there's a cargo cover that's actually under the seat, so there has to be accessibility to that. Between the 
information that I was able to obtain from the manual as well as a visual inspection of how the, the ladies' phaeton was constructed, I then had the knowledge of how to build the carriage that we used for this, this uh, 1993 Springfield Derry. One of the things that I had to deal with in the production of this car was that there really were no parts for, for the engine that I could purchase off the shelf. So naturally, parts had to be cast. So we chose Ware Foundry. It's uh, been in existence since the early 20s. It originally was a power plant, but we now serves the purpose of casting metal parts. been working closely with us is Bill Jordan, the man that owns the foundry. And Bill has a lot of experience in the foundry work and was able to follow my instructions and produce patterns and castings that we ultimately were able to machine into a successful product. The block alone consisted of 14 separate indiv individual patterns. And collectively, when it was done, there was simply one piece that had been cast. There are several parts in the carriage that um, in no way was I capable of producing. And one of those, of course, are the wheels. I found the name of a gentleman on the north shore of Boston by the name of Bruce Tompkins. Bruce owns a wagon wheel factory that has been in existence for approximately 150 years. And Bruce uses the same equipment that was used 150 years ago and is capable of producing wheels of the same quality, the same strength, the same design that were on the original ladies' fiat and carriage that was used by Frank and Charles Duryea 100 years ago. here they had about 30 people working here one person 
made hubs and one person made spokes and then somebody assembled the whole thing but the blacksmith made the tire and it was a crew in the woods that just cut lumber and material for building the wheels and wood for running the steam for, you know it was all run on steam and there was a time when they did it all by hand but that was quite a while ago ever since the like the civil war they had equipment to do most all of this type of thing I think what I'd like to do, at least uh, in terms of our beginning of this project, would be to take and assemble the carriage using the wheels, the front and rear axles and the springs, and at least build the carriage itself. After we get the carriage built, we can take the carriage body off the assembled axles, and from that point we can then begin putting the engine onto the rear axle. But at least at that point I want to get the carriage freestanding, and we'll take it from there. Okay? Let's go. Okay, what I need to do is determine which of these two springs is right and which is left. So why don't we stand this carriage body right up on its nose. Take this one out. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, pick it up just like that. Okay, got it? All right, I'll get the I'll get the Okay. Yeah. Make sure I got the correct side. All right, mark that as uh, R. Let me just double check on the other side. Make sure we got alignment here. Okay. Now before you put it down, let me just double check it one more time on the other spring. The holes line up on that correctly? I'm hoping they do. Um, that's what I'm trying to do, is to make sure I've, I've got the right spring on the right side and the left spring on the left side. Okay, that's good. This is the left spring. Now we should begin by putting the bearing on the shaft, sliding this through. Excellent. Okay. Put the uh, outer bearing in. Okay, it's coming in. It's coming in. All right. It's no, snug. It's it's snug. Okay. No, make it snug. Right. for the, the base of the block okay. also the straps to hold the springs in place right. let me just turn this around this way just for a moment I want to uh, just uh, check and make sure that they're on there straight Any more on that? no that's fine okay let me just check the other side All right, now we can do the front axle. Now, before we put this in place, we need to take the spring block. We have to drill two holes in the spring block. Oh, oops, no, that's, sorry, that's the right spring. It's that one. All right. Now we have 
to drill two holes through the uh, bottom that line up mm -hmm. with that. And and let's take and we'll disassemble the spring yep. here. We'll we can do that. And yeah, we right. can just uh, yeah, take, you get a what, 5 8 wrench. Yep. And when when we take it apart, he can drill the holes. Yeah, yeah. Clear. So we can we can assemble this now. The uh, put the tiller support piece right here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, make, sure, make sure we get the front correct to the back. Put that one right down the throat. Nope. You prep for that? It's not what it was intended to do, but I think it'll do it. Okay. Okay. The rest was just a matter of tapping into place. take some bolts and attach this spring bar okay. to the top half how, of the spring. How do you want to run this down? We'll put the bolts down through. Okay. The thread, threaded part is always concealed as much okay. as possible. Okay. It's the nature of the way that carriages were built. Yeah. Now this is this this particular piece, this spring bar, may not be perfectly straight with the spring, so uh, is that going to cause us? Just understand that it may not set grief later? perfectly straight. Is that going to cause us grief later? No, but I will correct it before the final assembly. Uh, is this just decorative up here? Or yes. Actually, in the original, that was like an eagle's head. That's what they used on all these spring bars. It was part of the craftsmanship of the day. Yeah. All right, we can put this on here. And uh, which it doesn't make any difference. There's no front to, back. front to back. There is, however, on the bolts. The bolts have to come from. Okay, just this watch out. From the front to the back. Here, David. Oh, the hammer behind you. Okay. Henry Ford would be correct. Not the other way, is it? No. <laughs> this is the front, so. Right. So we can put the wheels on the axle. Where's the cast the bearings already? Oh, there's a cast in that. All right. Why don't you get to the other wheel also, Jim? Okay, I'll get that. All right. Get his arms a break. Yep. Okay. 
the help you get nowadays. <laughs> Sorry. Only kidding, sir. Sorry about that. Okay. Alright. That should be on me. Alright, you can now double check these. You still Grab the reach. And the two half inch nuts. And the flat washer. Okay, I got the axle. Okay. Was this uh, always double nutted? Yes. One of the one of the interesting things about this carriage that differentiates it from other carriages is that this actually causes the reach to pivot in this way to the carriage body. Mm -hmm. In the original carriages, this was called a fifth wheel, and it was actually mounted this way so that the front axle turned on, on the, underneath the, uh, the carriage this way. And so basically, this is one of the first independent front end. wheels. Front wheel steering, right. Mm -hmm. not, not too tight. Okay. In fact, um, there were about 15 different firsts that were on that car that are still in use today. Mm. And the independent front wheel steering is certainly one of them. All right. Okay. Looks like we're ready to put these on. Uh, I hope so. All right, let's put the rear, the right spring on first. Now, the way this is set up Marked it right here. is the head of the bolt goes to the outside with a nut on the inside. All right. Do you have a, here, why don't you take that? I'll, I'll hold the spring. Okay. Just something temporary right now. Is that going to be in the way if we put it on the inside or put it on the outside? We have things in here. No, because this will take off. Once we get ready to deal with the engine, we can take okay. the whole spring right off. Because, okay. you know, I think, I think it may be a valid point, though. Okay. Go ahead, tighten it up. This is another tool that, uh, like we're, that they didn't have back then. I'm sure they that. They levers and... Well, they did have clamps, but I'm not sure they had all the sophisticated oh, yeah. tools we have today. Right. Okay. Outside out, right? Uh, yeah. All right. right. That's correct. Jake, you want to tighten that up for me? I can do that. Or, yep. All right. Maybe I'll Let's set. get the body. Jake, can we hold these? Yep. No. Okay. I can crawl over. I'll put the block of wood in, too. Feel heavy, huh? Yes. You can only pick up a car body that way. Some you can. Yeah, very, very light. Some of those new uh, plastic things. Hold this out. Take the other bolts behind you. Yep. I got them right in my hand. Oh, okay. Okay. Hang on a second. Okay. I don't have to scratch my nose. All right, now we need to put. Uh, at least some nuts on the bottom of one nut in each of them. Jim, can you pick up a little bit in the front? Sure. Not too much. Hi, right, why don't you bring the body up the uh, rocket irons and so we can set them on the spring bar. Okay. And secure them. I like that fine. Wash in a nut. Thank you. carriage weighed in about 150 pounds. Actually, the body itself weighs about 35 or 40, mm -hmm. and the iron weighs another 20 or 30, and then you get passengers in it, so it's really not a lot, a lot of weight that it has to support. Plus, it's structural. It's using the grain of the wood, mm -hmm. so it becomes fairly strong. Okay, we have, for all intent and purpose, assembled the carriage.
Okay, I think we're at an interesting point because now we want to put all these pieces, the block, the frame, the legs, onto the, onto the axle. So we get the block over here, the legs, um, we need the crankshaft and the bearing. Why don't you hand me the crankshaft and the bearing mounts? All right. Okay. Get this here. And the frame itself. We can get the bolts up there. Yeah, I got them. Okay. We set it on the axle, and we'll use one of those stands to support this end of the, of right. the block. Okay. Now again, the half-inch wrench is... It's over here. Over there, okay. okay. Got it. I cut a piece of wood so it wouldn't hurt that crank right. Tell me how it feels to have the motor on the axle. Oh, I tell you, this is, uh, you know, I, I hear the engine in my sleep almost, but I've never, I've never had it in my dreams that I've actually ridden in this car. Gotta go to you a little bit, sure. Leave it a little loose. All right, why don't, okay, you want to put that underneath the center of this, yeah. so it's in the center, it doesn't rock off. Yeah. All right, I think um, we can put the, the frame on. I don't know how you they, assemble that. Will you they put? Both, they both have to go together. Okay. Okay. Two long ones in the space. You've got to go between the bottom. Now, what is this? What's dowel? Um, These are dowel. The caps, the caps to the cylinder is dowel. So then once we once we get to a, a, a arrangement here and levelness, what I can do is I'll transfer from here into the into the main bearing caps. No. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should we hang All it? Alright, yep. Let's hang it. it hangs there. This comes uh the spacer comes up okay. just like that. Yep. And, and then get up here, hang the, on. The longer bolts go longer bolts go on the bottom. Okay. put the legs on and they go facing the back because this is what supports the uh, final right. drive shaft um, right we can adjust the well, we can do, we can adjust the height uh, just drop them all the way down yeah I'm just going to snug them of the uh, bolts. What did you tell me about the relationship of the slots, the center line of the clutch shaft? Was it the lowest or the highest? If you wanted to maintain the flywheel being in the utmost position toward here and have your cl uh, clutch and brake drums up, they want to be up as high as they want to be. They should go all the way up. Okay. And from there we can space then we it can down. drop it down. Right? Okay. That that should give you a quarter inch between the clutch drum and the flywheel, and the quarter inch between the the main bearing and the and the, uh, the flywheel. Now are each side the same deck running from the same from the left to the right, the right of the carriage? They both go to the same relationship out. That's correct. Um, <clears throat> I believe the top one, either one of these, goes to the top side of the axle on both sides the right and the left mm -hmm. then the bottom of the spring goes to this leg and on the outside of the axle there's a second one that goes down to this leg 
Not and really. that's, that's what supports the whole back end of the carriage onto the rear axle. Mm -hmm. Then the reach and the head block on the front of the carriage comes back and one goes in here mm -hmm. on each side, one goes in here on each side, and there's a third hole right here that comes in and catches the reach way in the back side, so it sort of gives it added stability on this end of the, of the reach. So those make up the 12 rods that hold the um, hold the, the engine to the rear axle and the engine to the front head block. Okay. That's it. Before uh, you before yes. you make any modification, any adjustments on that, mm -hmm. we have to square up the block. Okay. I just realized that it's not it's not as square as it can be. For so. The, uh, on that. Um, yeah, see. We need to um, establish some kind of a datum. How about if we go to the outside of the? straight edge across the tire, measure inward. No, it's got to be the axle. And then the axle from here to here. And just measure right off the top, right in the center line. Okay. 30 and 3 quarters. Okay. Let's get you in that corner. 30 and 1 quarter. So this is a half inch. This is going to go with this way, a half inch. Okay, that, that's good. That's good right there. Yeah. Might want to pick that up and relieve it, you know, the pressure because this one wiggles. And then we'll recheck that. Okay. Yeah. Alright, let's double check here. Okay, we have four and a quarter. We have four and Four and seven thirty seconds. That is fairly close. Yes. You want to try the crank again? Or just leave it down. Yeah. Let's check. Uh, try the back side of the axle, just for the hot house. Here? No, oh. the back side. There you go, the back that corner right there. Oh here. Yeah. Okay, thirty one and one eighth. 31 and 1 eighth. Okay. <laughs> so that, to the, 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 from that corner to here to that corner is on target. Let's try the square again. I can say the twist may be in that system there. In the, uh, in the casting of, the, of this arc. Okay. Let's record. Come in just a little bit, Jeff. Bingo! I need to bring back this.
go. Okay, now we're gonna have to put the wedges. This. I'm gonna put okay, I'm gonna wedges put the in the front wheel. Okay, side of it. You may need to uh, jockey the front a little bit. Okay, now hang on a second. Here's where we're gonna have a little problem: is getting that reach in through there. That's why I wanna okay. move the crankshaft. Whoops. Oh, we're hitting the clamp. Hang on. Okay. Get it. Okay, that's good. Right about there. Um, how about maybe we can clamp where that clamp go? I put it inside. It's on the it's on the welder or below the no on the floor on the floor. We're gonna have to raise the front of the block up because the springs are really beveled. Okay. So. Just a second. Anyway, okay. No, the wood won't go in. Pick up the center of the uh, uh, center bolt on the spring. Okay. Okay, we're one inch off. Um, this side is like. The, it, it's a front axle. I mean, the front axle is just this way a little bit because we haven't got the, the reach is being stressed. Right. Probably a way to do that is with the tiller. And that gives us a pretty straight line for the front. For the front. We're off by a 64th of an inch. Oh, wow. What are we going to do? Call Charles. <laughs> Redesign. <laughs> How do we tell the top from the bottom? Top goes away from the intake. Okay. Top goes away from the intake. All right. I don't see any. No, I don't hear the electric on. Dan? Okay, we now have the cylinder head, the combustion chamber, the intake manifold, the carburetor tube, and the carburetor. This is uh, a little valve inside that regulates the air flowing into the engine. Okay. This is the exhaust chamber. This uh, elbow attaches to the motor. This is the exhaust chamber. There's an exhaust, there's a valve inside here that operates uh, as, the as the need for exhaust gases to escape occurs. This valve is opened mechanically. Exhaust gases leave the elbow into the exhaust chamber and into a muffler that hangs down below the, uh, below the engine. Installing the timing mechanism for the exhaust valve. This uh, dries off the crankshaft. And also included in this, when we finish on this part of it, will be the ignition, by the ignition system, because it uses the reference of the crankshaft and this timing gear to signal when to fire the air fuel mixture. Okay. This operates the uh, the exhaust. You can see when it comes around, it hits this part of the exhaust valve, and that's what opens the exhaust valve. 
and there's a spring that holds the exhaust valve closed. And every time the crankshaft rotates like that, it forces the exhaust valve open. So that's that's part of the exhaust cycle, exhaust stroke of the work cycle. could, I always wanted to get students involved in the project. And of course, one, one component of this is the finish that is on the carriage. So I talked with Clifford Flint, who is the principal at Roger L. Putnam Vocational Technical High School, and asked if it was permissible for the students to, in the auto body shop, to become part of the production of this car. And he was more than gracious in allowing the students to use the shop during non-school hours, which is Saturday. And so six students from the auto body program came to the school and along with an instructor were able to prime the carriage body and all the wooden parts as well as give the finished paint. The whole time taking about seven hours from the time they began hanging the parts in the spray booth until the time when they actually finished for the day. So they definitely were, were intrigued by the, the concept of the car and, and wanting to be a part of it, but they also gave their all. Barbara Thomas was referred to me by a friend to do the upholstering on the car. Barbara runs her own upholstery business. And as you can see from the quality of the work that's in the, done in the upholstery, that I made a good choice. We're going to put on the side panel, and I wanted to show you um, how it was going to go on, because we need um, we're not going to use the old horse hair. We're going to use the synthetic horse hair. I left this open to show you um, basically what the springs, what they look like when they're compressed. You want to catch the springs in three different places.
Now this is synthetic wash there. We we'll use this today, it's a little easier to work with. I'm gonna put just another layer on there. And then we'll put the side of the cover of the fabric on. I'm bringing this as tight as I can right to the edge because we're going to use a trim on the edge over here. Richard, here's the back. Basically what we talked about doing in, um, from the pictures that you gave me, it's actually a channel back. It's called rolled and pleating. We're just going to staple this on the top, and then I'm just going to run a hand stitch across here and on the bottom, too. up and we're going to attach it in the center, but we're just going to attach the burlap. You want to see what it looks like for the apron? This is where the apron, how the apron will look, okay. and this will be rolled under so it'll be a finished edge there. And then the cushion. I have one made up. So you see how nicely neat the back channels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one more and then we're ready to take it for a spin. We're going to try and get um, fuel into, this, into the engine at this point. Um, the carburetor has a fuel adjustment, it has an air adjustment, and we want to get, make sure that the fuel going into the engine is enough to fire inside the cylinder. So I'll be controlling the, um, the fuel side of it, Jim's going to be hold, controlling the f spark side of it, and Ricky's going to be controlling the spinning of the engine. Um, Let me know when you want to spark it. Um, okay. Um, you ready? Ready? I'm ready. Give it a try. I'm I'm waiting, wa waiting for a while here. Okay. Let me get it off the compression stroke. It does have compression. Okay. Set? Yep. Yeah. Drawing in fuel, reach governor speed. When that came down, it's like. I don't know, once again, it's like, I don't know, it sounded strange, almost like there was some something firing through the exhaust. I may have just been imagining, but let's do it up one more time. You want the exhaust Yeah. Yeah, about like it was. Yeah. Um, of course, with the with the exhaust port up on this angle, it's going to have to fill up to there before it's going to push it out, unless it pushes out its vapors. Vapors, right? They dissipate out of there. Okay. Well, I tell you what. Let's let's go the other direction. Let's really cut back on the fuel. We may be just absolutely drowning the thing out. Okay. Let's try this time. Thank you. 
still drawing a pretty healthy amount of fuel. I could almost see the point um, where it was dripping. There was it drips down between strokes and then psh, pulls in the charge. Again, we could be too lean, we could be too rich. Just think of what poor Frank had to do, probably cranking it by hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that if they were Right. Machine shop, they built it at the sun. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. The next thing is a 90 degree drive, and I'll run it off of a eight horse. Well, they had drill presses. So that was better. Hey. What's that? Yep. Okay. Spin over a little bit, really. Just to make some breaks to points. It's already made a break. Okay, so it's not picking it up on the one ohm scale. It's picking it up on a ten ohm scale, though. That's fine. That's right. So that that's. Yeah, the hundred and the thousand ohms work fine. The only one that doesn't is the one ohm scale. Okay. No, I still want to. I still want to find out what I'm getting for spark. I have one more wire around here. Let's spin it over a little bit and see what we get for spark coming out of this. Not to, no, not because he spins it over. Spin it over with the motor. Oh, oh, you're gonna go that one. Yeah, to see what we get for for spark. You using me? <clears throat> well, I, can we check? E, C. Can we pull? Unless that's arcing between the electrode. E equals and IR. And, and it the side. could be bridging through the but side of the... But it's still sparking. But yeah, this not, spark is a spark. That's a spark. Yeah. And that's exactly what we need inside and the so chamber. And so we better get that inside this combustion chamber right. So it may be that we're losing... It, it could be jumping in all directions at the same time, meaning it could be going off the micata <coughs> pull off the carburetor the end plug the end plug mm -hmm. pull off the uh, combustion spark chamber mm -hmm. take the half inch bolt that we got in there that holds the micata and drill the end of that out so we don't have anything maintaining it in inward so all it has is micata around so all it has is micata around it to give us more insulation area around it more clearance See, the, the, end, goes, the, end, the end of the the end of the bolt has like an eighth inch or a three sixteenth hole in it, and I have an eighth inch that, that electrode going through. So there's only you know a good thirty second of an inch on the side. Okay. Open that up, just drill that out, and so that it will gap more. Isn't there an Allen plug in the back side well, of it? We're, we're going to have to take that out also. Oh, okay. All right. That's, then, that's the next then, step. Then let's let's do it because that is not the spark that's coming out of there. Yeah. That's what we need. That's what we need, right. Back it down just a little bit. Yeah, put them falling right there. Now, where are we? I'm also getting better.
talked about um, part of what's going on could very well be that the spark arm is traveling. As it travels and increases the air gap, the secondary bolt just dies too fast. We talked about threading the shaft and locking, taking out the, the uh, threaded rod mm -hmm. and locking mm -hmm. the spark arm at a given gap. Right. Let's try that. That, in other words, on a, on a fixed gap, we can fire it. And today, I think what we want to do is we want to make sure that it will at least run. Um, because that'll take care of answering the fuel questions. Mm -hmm. It'll take care of qu and questions on compression. It'll take care of stroke uh, ratios mm -hmm. and things like okay. that. We can fix the points to a certain dimension. I put so it, they won't, they won't be moving. Index that now, so you got yeah. about 25 or 30. Yeah, okay. Okay, something something happened. Do you want to check that? Yep. The, uh, yeah, red end. I don't know if you can see in there or not. No, I can't, but I can. Yeah, it's one less finger on there. Yeah. Okay, there's continuity. That's on the pin. What do you think? Check it again. Put it inside. Let's let's just double check the uh, make contact the electrode. Yep. Okay, so we have we have continuity there. Let me come down here. We have continuity here. Okay, so now we have that circuit is good. <clears throat> now, now the we blue have wire here that we had before is a moot point. Unless I th I don't know. I think it still should be attached you to here. I, that's what I'm thinking. Because that's our ground circuit. Exactly. And we want to make sure we have continuity back to the ground of the battery. Now, one way we can do that would be to put a nut on that screw uh, and put an eyelet on it. Mm -hmm. We just will use that other piece, put an eyelet on it and, and lock it up yes. in place. Okay. Now that's a spark. Now we have spark, and I think that that's a pretty healthy spark coming out of that now. It's a constant spark. I don't have a meter to measure it, but I'd say that even if we opened that up a little farther, we'd probably get even hotter spark. But at this point, yeah, right. This is our starting point. That's right. It's our starting point. Um, Are you happy with the timing up here, Dick? The timing of the spark of top dead? It's a few be few degrees before top dead center. Again, that that's not a critical point. I think is that that translates into horsepower. Right. At this point, we're just at least trying to get get it to fire up. Okay. Um, what do we got to lose? Ready. Okay. Gas on. Yeah. Back to me. Yeah, that's a good drip. Okay. Okay, ready? Yeah. Okay. Come on, baby. Oh, no, let it go. Let it go. Okay. Now, what we have to do is to get the combination to get the firing up again. Shut it down. It's only it's only an engine. It's it's only metal. It's only leather and rubber and wires and things like that. 
but it's the culmination of eight years that's that I have made this commitment to thick and thin to myself that I would do this. And um, when it when it fired off the first time, um, I I must say in all honesty that at some point I knew it was going to, but there's some unknowns that we have to work out. But it was a it was a very um, gratifying and rewarding experience that I took I took papers and I took pictures and I took um, various conversations that I've had over the years and sort of combined them and I I brought together a team I did not do this alone I have the two people that have worked with me for uh, almost a year now in this process and um, th we three built this engine so um, we and I think we all shared that same experience that that we had that we had accomplished something we had we'd really made a mark and it worked The transmission that was used on that car was a combination of two drums connected by a belt. And the belt um, had one technical problem with it. And the problem is that the, the belt would rub on the underside of the flywheel. And in Charles' plan, in order to change the rate of speed of the vehicle, you'd simply relocate the belt at some point in the radius of the flywheel so that if it's, for instance, if it's close to the center, the car would move at a low rate of speed because the surface speed of the flywheel is low. And if the carriage was to go at a faster rate of speed, the, the belt would be moved to the outer portion of the flywheel where the surface speed is higher. And on paper, it seemed like a good idea. But when Frank actually built that design, and for the record, on September 21st, 1893, that is the transmission that was used. It did not give the satisfaction that Frank, the mechanic and the machinist, wanted out of that car. As it turns out, in Chicago in 1893 was the Columbia Exposition. And Frank went to the exposition I think with the intent of doing some more research because he came back to Springfield with a design in his head. He put that design to paper. He machined out a series of clutches and drums and gears, all of which gave Frank the performance that he, was, that he expected and with which he was satisfied. So it was a provable, workable transmission. And that's the transmission that he used in 1894, January 18th of 1894. And he drove that car for four and a half miles. And he had no problems with the transmission. So it was a very good design. In fact, following Frank through the subsequent models of cars, he uses that system again. So it was a system that worked for him, and he decided to stick with it. When we knew that the carriage was running, when we knew how to start it, when we knew how to drive it, and when we knew how to stop it, we felt it was time. We felt that it was important that the city of Springfield have an opportunity to share a piece of this car, to be able to witness how it operates. 
So the day that we had our public demonstration, which was July 17th, we were nervous. public, when we first started that, gave out a round of applause that I could not believe. It was just, it was a high that I think, speaking for the three of us, that we're still all riding on. It was the, it was the pinnacle of our project coming together. That first public drive at the quad yeah it was a proud moment it was a proud moment for the team but it was a proud moment for me too because it was kind of fun to stand back in the crowd i wasn't part of the big hoopla i mean i helped start the car and i was there but i was able to walk out of that crowd and i was able to look around at the expressions hear the noise of the car hear the expression the, the applause uh and be part of that applause uh and it, it, just, it just made me feel good to see that what we had done was appreciated. To have had the experience to drive that car for the first time in 100 years, um, it was, it's, it's, it's a cliche, but it was a dream come true. And I lived it. It was very exciting. 